The prophets, when they appear on our earthly scene, are rarely as expected. A king is awaited, and there's a birth in a manger. The venerable, the bearded, the portentous are usually spurious. One of the oddest prophets ever was Sorin Kierkegaard, a melancholic Dane, a kind of clippity-clop ribald Hamlet, who, from the middle of the last century, peered quizzically into the swan, dryly noting, before they happened, such tragicomic phenomena of our time as universal suffrage, mass media, and affluence abounding. He, too, was insistent that the only way out of these gathering clouds of fantasy was to climb doggedly upwards to the rocky peak above them where God dwells. This church in Jutland is a very appropriate place to begin the story of Søren Kierkegaard. This was the district that his family came from. In the early years of the last century, when he was born, it was a very wild, lonely, and inhospitable place, whose inhabitants were notoriously prone, as he was himself all his life, to melancholy and introspection. The family's connection with the church is signalized by the plaque his father presented to it in his more affluent days. No doubt, partly at any rate, to draw attention to how greatly his circumstances had improved. Circumstances which, when he was a child here, were abysmally poor. The greatest single influence on Soren Kierkegaard was undoubtedly that of his father, a harsh, dour, guilt-ridden man. In his own way, deeply religious, and certainly a very dutiful father, yet somehow stricken. Soren was his youngest child and his favorite and the intimacy between them was very great. Then one day, some secret was disclosed. We don't know exactly what it was, but Soren has written that the effect upon him was as though he'd been in an earthquake. Thenceforth, their intimacy was broken. An idol had been overturned, and Soren Kierkegaard stood among the broken pieces, needing to look for another father. This quest, as we shall see, took him far beyond the narrow moral confines of his earthly father. Far beyond, too, the rigid creed and austere liturgy of this church, where his father once worshipped. More in keeping, perhaps, with the wild countryside outside, with its wild storms and furious winds but reaching beyond them too. Reaching beyond time itself and into eternity. Kierkegaard's father left Jutland as a boy to seek his fortune in Copenhagen, where he throve. Besides becoming very rich, he acquired a reputation as a man of wide reading and intellectual attainments. Nonetheless, a cloud over his life persisted. This was due to a strong sense of sin at having, as a poor shepherd boy, cursed God for the hardness and frustrations of his life. 
Another source of remorse was his seduction of a woman working in his house. Within a year of his first wife's death, he married her to legalize a daughter she bore him four months after their wedding. It was in a house such as this that he lived, and where Sorin, the youngest of his six children, was born and grew up. They were particularly intimate together. The father watched over Sorin's studies and tried to protect him from the sins he was so morbidly conscious of having committed, especially those of the flesh. Kierkegaard's mother, who appears to have remained almost a servant in the house, is ignored in all of Kierkegaard's subsequent reminiscences about his childhood. When Kierkegaard was a child asked to be taken for a walk, his father would suggest that instead they remain inside and travel in their imaginations. Thus the two of them would walk together, pounding round and round the room. Some of the father's congenital melancholy undoubtedly infected and stayed with his son. One of his stories, Kierkegaard describes a young boy turning over pictures of men the world considers to be heroes. Among them, a painting of the crucified Christ. He asks his readers to consider the effect of such an experience on a child. The effect on Kierkegaard, undoubtedly the boy in the story, was to make him question the nature of a world that could thus punish virtue and truth. This spot, Gilberg, the highest point here, has always been one of my favorite places, Kierkegaard wrote. From this spot, I've seen the sea rippled by a soft breeze, seen it play with the pebbles. From here, I've seen its surface transformed into a passive cloud of sea spray, and heard the falsetto notes which come before the low base of the storm. Here, I've seen, so to speak, the emergence of a world and its destruction, a sight which truly calls for silence. I, of course, would rather not speak of those who see nothing bigger in nature than matter, people who really regard heaven as a cheese dish cover and men as maggots who live inside it. In 1835, when he was 22, Kierkegaard spent a holiday on his own at Gilalai and often used to come up to this spot nearby looking over the sea. It is one of the recurrent crises in his life, what he would have called an either-or situation. His theological studies, unlike his brother Peter's, were going badly. He was wasting his time on other pursuits, some of them disreputable. There was always this gregarious side of Kierkegaard's character to be considered. His love of company, a glass of wine, a pretty girl. The trouble, of course, arose in the other dark side, the seat of his angst, where the clouds of his congenital melancholy would gather. His mood had been intensified by a whole series of deaths in the family three of his sisters, then two of his brothers, then his mother had died in rapid succession. As his brother Peter remarked, the survivors seemed to be spending all their time at the graveside. It all appeared to confirm his father's conviction that a curse had been laid on him and his offspring. Like Faust, he turned away from God and the devil had rewarded him by making him rich and respected. Now the time had come for the price to be paid. And Soren, as part of that price, was quite sure that he too would, be, would die young. How was he to shape up to so brief a, a, a sojourn here on this earth? 
Who was he supposed to be? And what was he supposed to do? What I really need, he scribbled down at the time, is to get clear what I must do, not what I must know. What matters is to find a purpose, to see what it really is, God's will, that I shall do. The crucial thing is to find a truth which is truth for me. This is what he was asking himself, perched up there on Gilbert and looking out to sea how to establish contact with the reality he already sensed in the universe, the quest for which made all others seem trivial and aimless, how to distinguish it from all the different sorts of fantasy, scientific, technical, political, erotic, which Western man was even then so busily constructing to evade this reality, how to get rid of all his own personal impediments, the ego, lifting its cobra head, the appetites reaching out greedily like octopus tentacles, stripping himself down until there was nothing, nothing at all, other than a sense of his own and his life's worthlessness, at which point he might hope to catch a fleeting glimpse of what he sought, and in catching that glimpse, find that after all there was a place for him in the great drama which Christ's life death and resurrection had unfolded to uplift, illumine, and redeem mankind. In his writings, under his various pseudonyms, more almost than any other writer, Kierkegaard recorded every thought and mood of his short life. For example, we shall not be so arrogant as to do anything on a grand scale. Rather, let's speak of a single individual human life and of the way it can be lived out here on earth. If one can see God in history, one can also see him in the life of the individual. To suppose otherwise is to delude oneself by yielding to the brutish imbecility which sees God only in the observations of nature. Say, where we're taught that Sirius is 180,000 million miles away from the Earth. The materialistic man is astounded by such alleged data. If every single man is not an individual simply by being human, then everything's lost and it's not worthwhile hearing about great world-shaking historical events. But the world wants to be deceived. Kierkegaard's first brush with the Danish establishment came not with the king. As a matter of fact, surprisingly enough, he and Christian VIII were on very friendly terms. Nor with the church, that was to come later, but with the clown in the person of a certain Goldschmidt, editor of a satirical magazine called The Corsair. Contrary to what's commonly supposed, the clown is very much a part of the establishment apparat, as I discovered myself when I was editor of Punch. There ought really to be a clown laureate, as there's a poet laureate. As a matter of fact, in practice, though not officially, there usually is one. And it sometimes happens that the same person doubles the two roles. Goldschmidt began by being a great admirer of Kierkegaard. In fact, he wrote that he considered either or an immortal work. The two men had a slight acquaintance with one another, and met from time to time in the course of Kierkegaard's street ramblings. The cause of the row was a man named Müller, an occasional clandestine contributor to the Corsair, whom Kierkegaard had known in his student days as an attractive, amusing, wild young man. Possibly he took him as the model 
of Johannes, the hero of the seducer's diary, which was the nearest that Kierkegaard came to writing an erotic book. In the course of an article in a literary review, Muller made some disagreeable personal remarks about Kierkegaard, who much resented them, and rather caddishly retaliated by letting out that Muller contributed to the Corsair, a disclosure which prevented Muller from getting a chair of aesthetics that he'd set his heart on. There the matter might well have rested, a typical enough episode in the notoriously backbiting literary circles in any capital city. Kierkegaard, however, felt bound to write to Goldsmith in somewhat pompous terms, telling him that he didn't expect the friendly relations between them to prevent him from being attacked by the Corsair. Whereupon, the magazine went to it with a will. In cartoons, lampoons, and satirical articles, they ridiculed Kierkegaard, especially his personal appearance, his spindly legs, his slight deformity, his trouser legs of different sizes, his large nose and hat down on his ears, parodying the intensity of his style, his many pseudonyms, making fun of his sense of being a voice crying in the wilderness, even accusing him of hypocrisy in denouncing luxurious living when he himself was a rich man and a lavish spender. The attack was mounted so effectively and sustained so long that it succeeded in making of poor Kierkegaard a public figure of fun. When he settled in his place in church, he was bound to hear someone muttering either or. He felt that all his peculiarities were under constant scrutiny, including his trouser legs. However much Kierkegaard may have disliked the consequences, the row over the Corsair was deliberately precipitated by him. Why? It seems to me that his spiritual development made him, by temperament, inclination, and necessity, an outsider. Even an involvement like marriage to Regina, a woman he was undoubtedly in love with, had to be rejected. Similarly, his vague intention to become a country clergyman, and even the money he inherited from his father, his only defense of his freedom and of his privacy, was to be spent as recklessly and speedily as possible, just to get rid of it. Like all temperamental outsiders, Kierkegaard was given to roaming the streets, finding thereby an anonymous companionship watching faces as they drift by, intimates with whom there's no intimacy, beloved but requiring no words or touch of love, known and yet forever unknown. One of the best descriptions of Kierkegaard is by a Scotsman named Hamilton, who, though he never made his acquaintance, observed him closely. There is a man, he writes, whom it's impossible to omit in any account of Denmark, I mean Soren Kierkegaard. He's a philosophical Christian writer, ever more dwelling, I might almost say harping, on the theme of the human heart. There's no Danish writer more in earnest than he, yet there's no one in whose way stand more things to prevent his becoming popular. He writes at times with an unearthly beauty, but too often with an exaggerated display of logic that disgusts the public. I have received the highest delight from some of his books, but no one of them could I read with pleasure all through. Kierkegaard's habits of life are singular enough to lend a perhaps false interest to his proceedings. He goes into no company and sees nobody in his own house, which might as well be an invisible dwelling. I could never learn that anyone had been inside it. Yet his one great study is human nature. No one knows more people than he. 
The fact is, he walks about town all day, and generally in some person's company. Kierkegaard himself was not unaware of his singularity and unpopularity, to which Hamilton draws attention. No doubt, he reflects, what makes me unpopular is not so much the difficulty of my books as it's my personal life. The fact that even with all my endeavors, I don't amount to anything, don't make money, don't get appointed to a job, don't become a knight of Denmark, but in every way amount to nothing. And on top of that, am derided. Kierkegaard was a kind of a mystical schizophrenic. The two sides of his nature were at war, the imaginative and the polemical. In the latter capacity, like Swift, he was given to lacerating himself with his furious indignation and got involved in the intellectual, moral, and even political controversies of his time. This brought him into contact with eminent people, for instance, with the king, whom he visited in his palace. In the year 1848, a time of great turmoil in Europe, two significant voices were raised, both at the time obscure and little heeded. One, Karl Marx's, proclaimed the ultimate and inevitable triumph of the proletariat in a worldwide class war, to be followed by the creation of a classless socialist utopia in which all government, all law, all exploitation of man by man would wither away and the human race live happily on their earth ever after. The other, heard here in Denmark, Soren Kierkegaard, scornfully dismissed such collectivist hopes for mankind as infallibly leading to a new and more comprehensive form of servitude. The divine right of kings had been abolished, but the divine right of the people, which had replaced it, would prove, Kierkegaard insisted, an even worse deception and give rise to regimes that exceeded any hitherto known in their brutality and claims to omniscience. I am the people. Le peuple, c'est moi, was an even more insanely arrogant claim than the famous one of Louis XIV, let us, c'est moi. I am the state. Curious enough, Kierkegaard had some personal experience of these monarchical pretensions through his friendship with Christian VIII, whose palace this was, and who relinquished his absolutist powers in 1848. No voice could have run more counter to the spirit of the age, the zeitgeist, than Kierkegaard's. When freedom was seen in terms of counting heads, he spoke contemptuously of the fallacy of numbers, and of how seen as a collectivity, human life must inevitably sink into a condition of brutishness and mindlessness. When truth conquers with the help of 10,000 yelling men, he wrote, even supposing that what they're yelling is true, their victory inculcates a far greater untruth. Against a new Leviathan, whether in the guise of universal suffrage democracy or of an equal, equally fraudulent triumphant proletariat, he pitied the individual human soul made in the image of a god who couldn't see a sparrow fall to the ground without concern. Contrasting with the notion of salvation through power, he held out the hope of salvation through suffering, 
the cross against the ballot box or the clenched fist, the solitary pilgrim against the slogan-shouting mob, the crucified Christ against the demagogue dictators promising a kingdom of heaven on earth, whether achieved through endlessly expanding wealth and material well-being or through the ever greater concentration of power and its ever more ruthless exercise. Marx and Kierkegaard, the two key voices of our 20th century. The curious thing is that though Marx purported to have an infallible scientific key to history, almost all his prophecies have failed to happen. On the other hand, Kierkegaard's forecasts, based purely on his imaginative intuition, have been fulfilled to a remarkable degree. Take, for instance, his profound sense that if men lost the isolation, the separateness, which awareness of the presence of God alone can give them, they would soon find themselves irretrievably part of a collectivity with only mass communications to shape their hopes, formulate their values, and arrange their thinking. Listen to this, for instance. Suppose someone invented an instrument, a convenient little talking tube, say, which could be heard over the whole land. I wonder if the police wouldn't forbid it, fearing that the whole country would become mentally deranged if it were used. On the whole, the evil in the daily press consists in its being calculated to make, if possible, the moment a thousand or ten thousand times more inflated and important than it really is. But all moral elevation consists, first and foremost, in being weaned from the momentary. If Christianity is really to be proclaimed, it will become apparent that it's the daily press which will, if possible, make it impossible. There's never been a power so diametrically opposed to Christianity as the daily press. Day in and day out, the daily press does nothing but delude men with the supreme axiom of this lie, that numbers are decisive. And Christianity builds on the thought that the truth lies in the single individual. If someone adopts the opinion of the public today, and tomorrow is hissed and booed, is hissed and booed by the public. A nation, an assembly, a human being can change in such a way that one may say they're no longer the same. But the public can become the very opposite and is still the same, the public. It is very doubtful then, he goes on, that the age will be saved through the notion of social organization or association. In our age, the principle of association which at best may have validity with respect to material interests, is not affirmative, but negative. It's an evasion, a dissipation, an illusion, whose dialectic is, as it strengthens individuals, so it weakens them. It strengthens by numbers, by solidarity. But from the ethical point of view, this is a weakening. Not until the single individual has established an ethical stance in despite of the whole world, not until then, can there be any question of genuinely uniting? Otherwise, it gets to be a union of people who separately are weak, a union as unbeautiful and depraved as a child marriage. All this might seem a kind of hopelessness. On the contrary, to Kierkegaard, it alone offered hope. The acme of hopelessness would be to hope that so aimless, so unillumined, so mindless a way of life could possibly work or breathe in those subjected to it anything but boredom and despair. The following changes will also occur. When the generation, which in fact has itself wanted to level, has wanted to be emancipated and to revolt, has wanted to demolish authority, has eliminated individuality and all that's organic and concrete, and has substituted such concepts as humanity and numerical equality among men. Then individuals have to help themselves, each one individually. Then it will be said, look, everything's ready. Look, the cruelty of these abstractions exposes the illusions of the finite. Look, 
The abyss of the infinite is opening up. Look, the sharp scythe of leveling permits all, every single one, to leap over the blade. Look, God is waiting. Leap then, leap into the arms of God. If that's being hopeless, may I never know hope. I once contemplated the possibility of not letting myself be taken over by Christianity, Kierkegaard wrote. To do nothing else but expound and interpret it. Myself not a Christian, in the final and most decisive sense of the word, yet leading others to Christianity. And only now, with the help of heavy sufferings and the bitterness of repentance, have I perhaps learned enough about dying away from the world so that I can rightly speak of finding my whole life and my salvation through faith in the forgiveness of sins. This was a favorite place of Kierkegaard's. He came here often, and all was alone, to meditate and reflect, seeking the solitude that he so loved, and that in the collectivized way of life that lay ahead, as he well knew, would be less and less available, perhaps even less and less desirable. I see him here very easily. A bizarre little figure, a kind of a, a comical monk, or better perhaps, a gargoyle, looking down from the heights of his own audacious speculation at a world whose very imperfections and absurdities, by contrast, revealed God's presence and proclaimed his name. Kierkegaard reflected much about reflection. Reflection, he wrote, is in truth a benevolent helper which discovers and assists in finding where the absolute object of faith and worship is. Namely, there where the difference between knowledge and ignorance collapses into a consciousness of ignorance. There where the resistance of an objective uncertainty tortures forth the passionate certainty of faith. There, where the conflict of right and wrong collapses in absolute worship with absolute subjection. Reflection itself doesn't see the absolute, but it leads, as it were, the individual up to it and says, here I guarantee when you worship here, you worship God. When reflection is completely exhausted, then faith begins. Everything which reflection can hit upon, faith has already seen through and thought through and emerged the other side.
Those who, like Kierkegaard, Dostoevsky was another example, see deeply into the nature of life, are able to project this knowledge into the future, and so, in some degree, foretell it. Thus, we find Kierkegaard again and again diagnosing with uncanny precision the ills that would befall a materialist society, especially when Christianity, the only possible corrective, partook of the same spirit. So that not only did science insist men could live by bread alone, but the spirit of Christ was invoked to say that they should. In our time, he wrote, the greatest menace comes from the natural sciences. Psychology will ultimately encompass ethics, and already there are intimations of a tendency to treat ethics as a brand of physics, to be calculated statistically, working over averages, as in calculating vibrations in the laws of nature. Foreseeing the obsessive interest to come in a social morality, only vaguely related to personal behavior, Kierkegaard writes, we have totally abolished the notion of imitation and at best hold to the paltriness called social morality. In this way, men cannot become truly humble so that they genuinely feel the need of grace. What is required of them is no more than social morality, which they fulfill tolerably well. Is not the truth of the matter really this, that man is just like a child who would rather be free from being under his parents' eyes. Isn't this what men want? To be free from being under the eyes of God. He goes on. When Christ resolved to become the savior of the world, a lament goes up from all humanity. Sighing grievously, they ask, why do you do this? You'll make us all unhappy, simply because to become a Christian is the greatest human suffering. Christ, being an absolute, explodes all the relativity whereby we humans live. In order to live in the spirit rather than the flesh, as he requires, one must go through crisis after crisis, being made thereby, from a human point of view, as unhappy as it's possible to be. As Kierkegaard, became increasingly gripped by the great drama of the Christian faith, in his own terms moving into the third or religious phase of his spiritual pilgrimage, it was almost inevitable that he should fall out with the church. This nearly always happens, as a Wesley was to find no place for himself in the Anglican establishment, and a Tolstoy was to be excommunicated by the Russian Orthodox Church. It would be hard to detect a saint in a temperament as cantankerous as Kierkegaard's. Even his undoubted mystical insights were heavily laced with irony. Yet, without any question, as his short life drew towards its close, his sights were fixed ever more firmly on what is transcendent and eternal in our mortal life. It is for this reason that the Danish church was particularly abhorrent to him. So genial, so worldly, with even the salaries of its clergy and bishops paid for by the secular state. Nor is it in any way surprising that his Venom was concentrated specially on the person of the celebrated Bishop Munster, mundane, gifted, socially sought after, and his father's honored and respected spiritual advisor. I think of him in this very church, boiling inwardly as he listens to one of the bishop's eloquent discourses in which Christ's sublime command to his followers to die in the flesh and be reborn in the spirit is reduced to the graceful moral platitudes of a relatively enlightened bourgeoisie. No doubt out of filial piety, he held his fire till the bishop had died 
in January 1854. He waited until H.L. Martinson, his old theology tutor, had been appointed to succeed Munster as bishop. It was this same Martinson who had so enraged him by referring to Munster in a funeral oration as one of the whole line of witnesses to the truth, which he said, like a holy chain, stretched back through the ages from the days of the apostles. If I apply this observation to any of the holders of the sees of Canterbury and York during my lifetime, I have no difficulty whatever in understanding Kierkegaard's furious indignation. Anyway, the article duly appeared early in December and was followed by 10 others in the same strain. The series was subsequently continued in, a, in some pamphlets he wrote called The Instant. In essence, Kierkegaard was making exactly the same point as Pascal in his provincial letters, which incidentally he'd been reading just about this time with great delight. Each was insisting in a different idiom and in quite different social circumstances with all the irony and emphasis at their command that the one way surely to abolish Christ's kingdom irretrievably and forever was to make it of this world. Pascal's shots were fired at the hair-splitting worldly Jesuits. Kierkegaard's at the Danish clergy, which he insisted should at all costs be shunned. Let me just read what he wrote. Parsons live by presenting the sufferings of others, and that is regarded as religious, uncommonly deep religion even, for the religion of the congregation is nothing but hearing this presented. As a religion, charmant, just about as genuine as tea made from a bit of paper which once lay in a drawer beside another bit of paper, which had once been used to wrap up a few dried tea leaves from which tea had already been made three times. Kierkegaard's scorn for church dignitaries applied equally to an evangelist and social reformer like Grunfeld. Here too, Kierkegaard proved to be an uncannily accurate prophet. A century later, we find churches of all denominations preoccupied with what is called the social gospel, and often falling over one another as they struggle to get onto the revolutionary bandwagon, even though it's moving at top speed away from Golgotha and into the kingdoms of the earth, which Christ so contemptuously rejected when the devil offered them to him. It was in making this prophetic and profoundly important point that Kierkegaard felt able at last to put aside all pseudonyms and mystifications and write as himself, facing whatever consequences might ensue. Kierkegaard's words were little noticed outside Copenhagen and even there soon forgotten but it proved to be uncannily prescient, to the point that today, everywhere, people are asking themselves whether perhaps this weird little Dane with the many pseudonyms may not, after all, have had the heart of the matter in him. Through my writings, Kierkegaard wrote, I hope to leave behind me so accurate an account of Christianity in the world that an enthusiastic, high-minded young person will be able to find in them, as it were, a map of Christian relationships. 
I've not had any assistance in this from past authors. The early church fathers I found failed in one essential qualification for it. They didn't know the world. In his journals, in an entry later on in his life, Kierkegaard writes of the delicious irony that it would be if an audience were so large and the room so filled that the speaker could not get in. <laughs> Kierkegaard modestly called himself a Christian auditor. An apostle, he wrote, proclaims the truth. An auditor is responsible for discovering counterfeiters and therefore has to have been in his time a bit of a counterfeiter himself. Kierkegaard, however, achieved much more than just being an auditor or topographer of Christianity. He also charted a new course for others to follow in his famous three stages, from the aesthetic to the ethical to the religious. He went through each of the stages himself, of course, as he recounted in his books. In them, he was writing his own spiritual autobiography, which is why he used pseudonyms, each of which, even Johannes the seducer, represented some self he had explored and shared. The aesthetic stage was the equivalent of paganism, seeking satisfaction through the senses, in physical beauty, erotic excitement, through the exercise of artistic skills, or through celebrity or riches, through success in any of its guises. As for the ethical, it represented an awareness of God, but not an awareness of man's limitations. What could be more ridiculous than man supposing he could make laws which were just, achieve brotherliness by means of an equitable distribution of wealth and opportunity, sustain a religious faith with only earthly ends. In short, establish a kingdom of heaven on earth with the clocks ticking away eternally and elected parliaments exercising divine authority. So he found himself relentlessly pushed into the third stage, the religious stage. This was where all the pseudonyms were put aside, and he became just Soren Kierkegaard, a poor sinner who knew nothing except that he existed now, with time as an eternal present, and that whatever fate might lie in store for mankind, they never would see in this earth their only habitat, or in history their only destiny. In the aesthetic phase, life is an experience. In the ethical one, a process. But in the religious phase, it's a drama. For Kierkegaard, existential in that its central character, the crucified Christ, exists now, thereby making now always. A quality that I particularly admire in Kierkegaard is his courage. The courage of a man by nature timid and even cowardly having decided that his life must be dedicated to looking for reality or God, he pursued this aim undeviatingly to the end, in spite of physical frailty and ill health, ridicule, loneliness, every sort of discouragement. His chosen mode of expression was the written word. A whole stream of books, articles, every sort of prose composition came from his pen. In the case of his books, he used up his inheritance to pay for their publication, so that on the day of his death, not one penny remained. His life and his money expired together. By his 43rd year, Kierkegaard's life was exhausted, and in November 1855, he died. Here, his nephew, thus described his end. Never have I seen the spirit thus break through the earthly husk 
and impart to it a glory as of the transfigured body on the resurrection morning. He took my hand in both of his. How small they were, and thin and palely transparent. And said only, thanks for coming, and now farewell. But these simple words were accompanied by a look, the match of which I've never seen. It shone out from a sublime and blessed splendor, which seemed to me to make the whole room light. Everything was concentrated in those eyes as the source of light, heartfelt love, blissful dissolution of sadness, penetrating clearness of mind, and a jesting smile. These were some of his last written words, expressing very beautifully the mood in which he died. I have nothing more to add, but let me merely say this, which in a way is my life, is to me the content of my life, its fullness, its bliss, its peace and satisfaction. Let me express this, this view of life, which bears the idea of humanity and of human equality. Christianly, every man, the single individual, unconditionally, every man is equally close to God. How close and equally close? Loved by him. Consequently, there is equality, the equality of infinity between man and man. If there is any distinction, it is that one person bears in mind that he's loved perhaps day after day, perhaps day after day for 70 years, perhaps with only one longing, a longing for eternity, so that he really can grasp this thought and advance with it, concern himself with this blessed occupation of reflecting on the thought that he's loved, and not, alas, because of his virtue. Another person perhaps doesn't remember that he's loved, perhaps goes on year after year, day after day, and doesn't think of his being loved. Or perhaps he's glad and grateful to be loved by his wife, by his children, by his friends, by his contemporaries, but he doesn't think of being loved by God. Or perhaps he laments not being loved by anyone and doesn't think of being loved by God. Infinite, divine love, which makes no distinction. Yes, but what of human ingratitude? If there is an equality among us men, in which we completely resemble each other, it is that not one of us really thinks about being loved.